Howdy folks, and welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles, all you paddock hole you hope. <laughs> I've forgotten how to speak English. I hope you all had oh I'm don't worry, we'll cut this out. <laughs> I hope you all had a good weekend. Um <laughs> You wouldn't believe I do this for a living, would you? Uh, <laughs> right, anyway, where were we? Oh yeah, mingles with jingles. I knew I had to do something tonight. Anyway, after last week's ridiculously depressing episode of Mingles with Jingles, I'm going to try to keep things a bit more upbeat in this episode. Uh, I've got quite a busy week to look forward to. For a couple of reasons, uh, I'm going to have to go to London again to get yet another Russian visa, because, as I'm sure you're all aware, I'm heading off to St. Petersburg. Although, I'm sure you weren't aware of the date, 23rd to the 25th of March next month, to record my voice lines and get my picture taken for Admiral Jingles in World of Warships. Now, this is not my first rodeo. This is, in fact, going to be the third time I've been to Russia. And I'm kind of getting used to the whole visa application process now. Or at least I thought I was until I went to complete the application form online for this one. Now, for a British citizen going to Russia, they want to know everything. I mean, from the side of your inside leg measurement to the political affiliations of your great-great-grandfather. And particularly if you're like me and you have military service under your belt, they suddenly get very interested and want to know all kinds of things. I mean, it's not quite as bad that I needed to go and dig out my service certificate so I could remember exactly what ships I served on where and when, but they, they are very interested in what you actually did when you were in the military. And then, of course, they also want to know all of the countries that you visited in the past 10 years. And of course, because I keep going to Russia, <laughs> that list just keeps getting longer and longer. And then, of course, because I'm self-employed, although technically you could argue I work for YouTube, um, they want bank statements, which have to be stamped and signed by my bank. So there's a lot of printing stuff out and going to get stuff certified and authorised and blah blah and so on and so on. And it took about an hour in total just to fill out this visa application. And the questionnaire ran to something like 15 or 16 pages. Once I said, yep, I was in the military, oh, there's another two pages of questions that you have to answer. Yeah, you get the general idea. It must have been 15 or 16 pages of questions. All of this, of course, in direct contrast to when I went to Russia the last time and took Rita with me, and she had to fill out exactly the same application, but she's a Portuguese citizen, so three pages. It was almost like, oh, oh you're Portuguese? Yeah, we don't really care. Yeah, sure, come to Russia. Knock yourself out. But, bizarrely enough, make sure you have medical insurance. They didn't care about me. <laughs> I wasn't required to provide proof of medical insurance. Uh, you know, I could fall down with a heart attack in the streets of St. Petersburg. It's like, now nah, you're British. <laughs> Tough. Um, but apparently they like the Portuguese. Like, oh, we want to make sure that you, you know, survive your visit to Russia. So that was kind of weird. But like I said, this is the third time I've done it now. So I'm kind of getting used to the process. Or I thought I was until I actually saved the whole 15, 16 page application and hit the print button and it spat out five pages of paperwork. At first I thought the printer had died halfway through the print process, but I, I checked and no. Now the actual visa application, the thing that you print out to take to the visa office, is only five pages. Now I know it wasn't five pages the last time, and the first time I had to go to the Russian visa office in London, I, I was printing out war and peace in order to get everything checked but this time around despite the fact that i answered exactly the same number of questions as the first and second time i printed out a visa application for russia in fact technically you could argue that this time around i've actually filled out more information than the first two times because since the first two times i have extra visits to russia that have to be included on the form and yet same or more numbers of questions answered on the application process has resulted in a set of documents which has basically thrown away two-thirds of the information that I input compared to my previous two visits to Russia. I have no idea what's going on. Is it just, well, yeah, you've been here twice before. We, we trust you. It, this is fine. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's it. I haven't got a clue. I do feel vaguely cheated, of course, because I still sat there for an hour answering all the questions, even if they don't appear to have actually wanted 
most of the information that they asked me to provide. But you know what's going to happen now, of course, don't you? I'm going to get on the train, I'm going to go to London, I'm going to pitch up at the visa office with my five-page documentation. They're going to say, where's the rest? <laughs> That's what I'm expecting to happen. You know it to be true, because this is exactly the sort of thing that happens any time I'm going anywhere. That's just the way it is. Also this week, we're on Tuesday, um, we're going to go and take a look at some new kittens. We've decided we want to get a new cat, and it's going to be a, a kitten. Um, because I never... We've, we've already got the two cats. Well, technically they're Rita's. Although she's given Juzi to me. And Juzi's great. She is the perfect cat. She's so calm and good-natured and sweet and polite. She's almost like a dog. <laughs> I mean, she actually does what you tell her to do. She's just a great cat. Um, but I never knew her when she was a kitten. And it's the same with uh, Rita's other cat, Crystalline. Uh, who actually really likes me now. It only took her four years. <laughs> four years of being patient and, you know, just treating her well before she got over her innate distrust of anybody who isn't Rita. Uh, they're both rescue cats, by the way, so it's entirely understandable. I mean, they were both horribly mistreated when they were kittens until Rita rescued them. Um, but I've never had a kitten, so we decided we're going to get a third cat, and it's going to be a kitten. And I kind of had my heart set on either a Maine Coon or a Ragdoll. Now, these are going to be big cats. I mean, Maine Coons, I think, are the biggest uh, breed of domestic cats in the world, and Ragdolls are not much smaller. But, wow. Trying to get your hands on a pedigree cat in Britain? It's a bloody nightmare. I mean, it's not like buying a fridge where you just walk into the shop and say, yeah, I want that one. You hand over the money and then you walk out with the fridge or somebody delivers the fridge. God, no. I mean, I kind of wish it was, but I can also understand why it isn't. You see, a lot of people who are selling cats, particularly pedigree kittens, uh, they don't just want to know, can you afford to pay for it? They want to know what kind of environment the cat's going to be living in. Uh, what's your home like? What are you feeding? And... Um, and uh, cleaning arrangements like, are there any other cats in the household? Are there any other animals in the household? How much exercise is it going to get? Is it going to be an indoor or an outdoor cat? And so on and so on. And, and I, I get it. This is actually a good thing because it means they, they're concerned to make sure that their animal is going to a good home. You know, it's going to have a good life. It's going to be well looked after. And, and I absolutely 100% support that sort of thing because in the past in this country we've had all too many problems um, with people buying a kitten for their kids for Christmas and then suddenly realizing that oh you actually have to put quite some work into looking after this thing and it's oh it's just too much bother and so the kitten goes into a bag with a brick and gets thrown into the river um, so yeah I get it and I approve you know not of throwing kittens into rivers in bags weighed down with bricks but I approve of the whole process whereby they actually take an interest in where the cat's going to uh, before they're prepared to sell it to somebody. So, you know, that's great. But that's not the sort of thing I'm talking about here. The first thing we did when we decided we wanted to get a new cat was to Google the process. Uh, and we didn't just decide this weekend we wanted to get a new cat, by the way. This is, well, well, I think we must have come to the decision about two months ago. And it's been taking that long just to find somebody who's willing to sell us a pet without just dicking us around. I mean, I can remember when I was a kid, vaguely, <laughs> we're talking 40 years ago here, um, when buying a pet was literally just like buying a fridge. You walked into a pet shop, you said, that one, please. Whether it was a cat, a dog, a budgie, a turtle, whatever. And you walked out with the pet. But that just doesn't really seem to happen these days. Unless we're talking about a pet shop that specialises in something exotic, you know, lizards, reptiles, uh, or exotic fish. Most pet shops don't actually sell pets. They sell pet food and pet supplies, and they might sell goldfish, uh, you know, aquarium fish, or maybe um, some birds. But they don't sell cats and they don't sell dogs. If you want to buy a cat or a dog, you have to either personally know a cat or dog breeder, or you go online, and there are various different websites set up. It's, it's almost like buying a used car, going to autotrader.com and inputting your search parameters. And it's exactly like that for buying a cat or a dog. 
The problem is that in exactly the same way as buying a used car, there are a lot of scammers out there. The very first Maine Coon kitten that I saw that I liked the look of and I thought I could afford, um, and it wasn't too far away either, because of course you have to actually go to the person selling your new pet and then collect it and take it home. So this was somebody in Southampton that I found on one of these pet trading websites, I suppose, for want of a better term, uh, who was selling a female Maine Coon kitten. So I thought, perfect, exactly the sort of thing I'm looking for. Hello, you know, this is my name. Um, I'm very interested in buying your kitten. Is it still available? And then the next day, I got a reply back via email, and it just said, yes. <laughs> so I thought, okay. A woman of few words. Well, okay, I, I'm very, very interested in in uh, coming up to take a look. Um, these are the arrangements that we've made to take care of her. This is the kind of life she can expect to have. You know, we've got two other cats in the house. They're both adults. We've got a dog. Um, going to be an indoor cat. We've got these arrangements made for feeding and sanitation and so on and so on and so on and so on. If you have any further questions about me, don't hesitate to ask. And I'd like to come up and take a look at the kitten uh, next Tuesday. If that would be okay for you, please let me know. Top tip, by the way, very important if you think of buying a new kitten or puppy, particularly if they're pedigree, always make sure you view them beforehand, at least with their mother and preferably with their mother and their father, just to make sure it is actually a pedigree. So you're getting what you're paying for. Well, anyway, a couple of days went by and then I got a reply. Yep, next Tuesday is fine. At this point, it was starting to feel like I'm pulling teeth. <laughs> okay, okay, Tuesday's fine. But where exactly am I going? Because I don't know where you live. So, okay, we've established that I'm coming up on Tuesday to see and possibly buy the cat. But I don't know where I'm going because you so far haven't actually provided me with an address. So I popped that email off. And then a week went by with no reply. And then eventually the reply was... Sorry, the cat has been sold. Now, during the entire course of my correspondence with this person, I received precisely 16 words from them. <laughs> okay. And then, after crushing all of my hopes and dreams, I'm back on the same website a couple of days later, looking for the same kind of cat. And I can't help but notice that this person is selling what appears to be exactly the same cat. Right, not the same kind of cat, it's the same picture, it's the same details, and everything. Again. So I think I probably dodged a bullet on that one. Well anyway, I didn't give up. I, I went back online, and this time I broadened my search parameters, and I found what appeared to be the perfect kitten a little bit further away. This was uh, near Ashford in Kent, which is on the far side of London from us, so we're talking a good hour and a half, two hour drive. Assuming we get good traffic, but yeah, it's going to be worth it. So I opened a line of correspondence with this new cat breeder and everything appeared to be going perfectly well. You know, this time they were answering all of the questions that I was asking them. They didn't appear to have a huge number of questions for me, which probably should have set off some alarm bells, but like I said, I'm new to this whole process. But everything seemed to be going well. It was looking good. And then right before the point where I said, OK, can we come up and take a look at the cat? Where do you live? They asked for a £100 deposit. Yeah. So let me get this straight. I don't know you. I've never met you. Uh, you are, in fact, completely anonymous. Uh, I don't even know this cat exists because I've never seen it. And before you give me the opportunity to come up and see it, you want me to pay a £100 deposit to reserve a cat, which, as far as I'm concerned, at this precise moment in time, is nothing more than a picture on the internet. You must think I was born yesterday. So, yeah, nothing much came of that deal either. And at this point, I'm starting to get a bit disheartened. Well, enter incompetent camera minion Eddie. Yes, my good friend Eddie, who I knew from my Navy days. He'd heard that we were looking for a cat, and he'd spoken to his mother about it. His mother had said, well, have they tried that cat breeder in Fairham? Now, for those of you not familiar with the geography of the towns in Hampshire, Fairham's about three miles from where I live. <laughs> and remember, 
I had my heart set on either a female main Coon kitten, or failing that, a female ragdoll kitten. And this cat breeder specialises in Maine Coons and ragdolls. Three miles from where I live. I couldn't believe it. I went on to Google and I actually did a search for cat breeder in Fairham. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They have a website, but it, for some reason it just doesn't appear on Google. So thank God for Eddie's mum. Anyway, got in touch and they're absolutely fantastic. And on Tuesday, we're going up to see the kittens with their parents and it's all looking good. All of their female Maine Coon kittens are currently reserved, um, but they do have a female ragdoll, which nobody has actually claimed yet. Um, we'll, you never know, we might, we might be coming home with a new kitten on Tuesday. Failing that, they do have other Maine Coons and ragdolls that are expecting litters very, very soon. Um, so, yeah, I think we finally found our cat breeder. I will, of course, be filming uh, the introduction of the kitten to their new home. The plan is to have the new kitten live in the man cave uh, for the first three days at least. Obviously you want the new cat to get used to its new surroundings, but you also want the other animal residents of the house to get used to the smell of the new cat before you introduce them to each other. And then one at a time we'll bring the other pets in to, you know, introduce them to each other, to socialise them, get them used to the, you know, the new resident. And I, of course I'm going to be filming all of this, so I think that would be some interesting and amusing footage to have in future episodes of Mingles with Jingles, and I'm really looking forward to it. And, you know, hopefully you lot are as well. Although, getting videos done in those first three days, you know, when it's just me and the new kitten in the room, and the door's shut and the rest of them are not allowed in while the new cat's getting used to its new home, that's going to be interesting. Because the thing about Maine Coons and Ragdolls is that they're very talkative species of cats. Species? Breeds. Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, particularly when they're kittens. So, she's probably not going to understand that Papa needs peace and quiet while he's working. But it's okay, I've got a plan to deal with that. I've got a bottle of whiskey that I will be adding to her water bowl. <laughs> In order to shut her the hell up. No, of course not, don't be silly. Whiskey's far too expensive. I'll use gin instead. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking, okay. Of course I'm not going to give alcohol to a kitten. Uh, you know, they say that Britain is a nation of pet lovers. There's more truth to that than you know. Not a lot of people realise that the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was founded in Britain long before the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. So make of that what you will. Anyway, I'm sure it's all going to be great. Anyway, moving along swiftly. Avenger 2002 had a really good question this week. Dear Jingles, greetings from Croatia. I have a pretty simple question for you. I've played Armored Warfare in the past, and I decided to come back and see how it's doing. I've played a couple of games, and there's nothing really that glaringly wrong about it, and the game looks and feels pretty good, at least from the surface. There's been a bunch of new vehicles added. A new vehicle dealer intended to familiarise the new players to the core gameplay. They added story-driven co-op campaigns, and Global Ops seems pretty interesting. After that, I checked out the player population on the Steam charts, and I noticed that in 24 hours the maximum number of players were around 150 with the all-time high being around three to four hundred. That confused me, since there seems to be nothing wrong with the game, at least from an outside view, without playing too much or being informed about company politics. Why are there so low player numbers? Why have you stopped making Armored Warfare videos, and why is such a good-looking game, from the game mechanics, graphics, and overall enjoyment standpoint, failing this hard? It's not like there isn't a market. And if my opinions aren't false, that the company and its approach to the consumer isn't doing anything wrong, could you maybe spread awareness about the game? It seems like a pretty good game to me, from this, albeit shallow, inquiry that isn't supported by research of company management and politics, etc. And I think it'd be a shame to see the servers shut down. You have a large following, and if 1% of your fan base were to install and play the game tomorrow, it'd be a massive change. I know you spent a lot of time and money in the game, and if the publisher isn't being a total asshole, I'm sure you'd be happy to see the game being played again. I sincerely hope you address this question. P.S. I know Obsidian used to be the developer, but got fired. But I still don't see that as a reason to have the play account so low. Sincerely, Avenger2002, your loyal viewer, follower, and salt miner. Um, yeah. You know, I can't actually remember the specific reason why I stopped doing Armored Warfare videos. I mean, it wasn't to do with the political fallout when Obsidian got fired as the developers. I mean, that was unfortunate, but... 
that wasn't it. I, I remember going back to the game and doing a video to see... There'd been a major patch which changed some pretty fundamental parts of the core gameplay mechanics. I can't remember exactly what the changes were, but it was something to do with ammunition types and armour. And also they changed artillery so that it, you couldn't actually play artillery in player versus player. You could only play it in operations. And they changed the way it works, so it was actually more like a more like a sort of indirect fire tank destroyer than artillery as we know it. But I can remember my impressions overall being quite favourable and thinking that the patch seemed to do a good thing and expected it to help improve player numbers. But then I never really bothered playing any further from that point, and I can't really remember exactly why. I don't think there was a specific reason. I think it was more just a case of, well, the game's all right, but I've got World of Tanks. And if I wanted to play a game that was like World of Tanks, I'd play World of Tanks. Now, I appreciate that the whole point to Armored Warfare, aside from them being modern vehicles, um, was that it wasn't like World of Tanks. You know, there were definite differences. But that was when Obsidian were developing it. That was the direction Obsidian wanted to take it. And Obsidian got fired by the publishers because they were making the game not like World of Tanks. Now, what the game might have ended up looking like if Obsidian had been left in charge? Well, that's a matter for speculation, but we'll never know because they got fired and the publisher took it in another direction to try to get a piece of that World of Tanks pie by taking their modern tank game and making it more like World of Tanks rather than less. And I can kind of understand that, but again, we're right back to the original. If I wanted to play a game like World of Tanks, I'd just play World of Tanks. And I think that as well as the fact that while I certainly didn't think there was anything wrong with the game, it never really grabbed me, is the reason why I sort of stopped playing it. And definitely the reason why I stopped doing videos on it. But there's been a lot of water under the bridge since then. It's well over a year, at least since I did an Armored Warfare video, or since I even played it. So what do you think? Should I, should I go back and take a look? I mean, I'm going to be hopelessly out of touch with developments in Armored Warfare, because I know nothing about what's happened in at least the last year. But maybe that's a good thing, because it means that if I did go back to Armored Warfare now, I wouldn't be going back with any preconceived baggage, or with the bare minimum of preconceived baggage about how I'm expecting the game to play, and what it should be like, and what it used to be like, and so on and so on, because I can barely remember what it used to be like. It's been that long since I've played it. This probably means that I'll get more than my usual share of things wrong, uh, just by virtue of not having played the game in such a long time. I won't realise, you know, the, I won't be familiar with the patch history, the various changes that have been made. I will quite literally be going in with a completely fresh set of eyes. Maybe that's, I don't know, that might be interesting. What do you think? Should I give Armoured Warfare another crack of the whip? Would you like to see what I think of Armoured Warfare? And whether or not I would still recommend it after all this time. Let me know in the comments. Speaking of being relatively new to games, has anybody heard of Soviet Womble? It wouldn't surprise me if you have. Um, he's a fairly huge YouTuber. Certainly way bigger than me. I'm not entirely sure, but I think uh, he's definitely got over 3 million subscribers. So, yeah. He's pretty popular. And I can see why. I've watched... I've watched a lot of his bullshittery videos, where he just asses about in games like Armour 3 and Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Uh, and they're highly amusing. I mean, they are so funny. You can see why he's got the number of subscribers that he has, but... Well, I also follow him on Twitch. And imagine my surprise last week when I found him streaming World of Warships. So I thought, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> Sat down in front of the big screen TV to watch his live stream. And it was good. I mean, he wasn't. <laughs> he was absolutely hopeless. Even more so than me. But he at least has the excuse of being new to the game. And he was playing with a bunch of his usual suspects who play with him in Armour 3 and Counter-Strike. But some of these guys had at least played World of Warships before and had a vague idea of what was going on. And it was probably them that got him to try the game. Um, so I sat there laughing my ass off at him. <laughs> Uh, for about half an hour or so. 
And then I ended up joining him for his live stream. And later on, we were joined by Ashley, a.k.a. Ashley, who's a North American um, World of Warships community contributor that has an EU account. Now, Womble had absolutely no idea who I was, but some of the people that he was playing with, because they were more experienced World of Warships, suppose, like, oh, it's the Mighty Jingles, yeah, get him in the division, and so on and so on. And we, we had a, a lot of fun uh, playing World of Warships with Soviet Womble, who was a complete noob, <laughs> and had no idea what he was doing, but seemed to have a really good time doing it. The thing is, it's not that he's a bad player. Well, at the moment, he is a very bad World of Warships player. He literally, I mean, he's sailing around in the gallant, firing armor, piercing and everything, right? So, <laughs> at the moment, he's a pretty bad World of Warships player. But when he watches other videos, when he watches Rising Storm Vietnam or his Counter-Strike Global Offensive or Armor 3 or Player Unknown Battleground videos, he clearly isn't a bad player. You know, he knows what he's doing in those games. He just doesn't take it seriously. And that's the, that's the attraction of his YouTube videos. And so, you know, when you're playing with somebody who's new to the game, your natural inclination is to tell them what they're doing wrong so that they can become a better player. Kind of wasting your time with Womble. <laughs> I have no doubt that he will become a better player, but it'll happen in his own time. And in the meantime, while he's being utterly crap, there's all kinds of hilarious footage for a YouTube video. Um, but I just thought it was great that his friends had gotten him into playing World of Warships. Because at the moment, I mean, okay, I'm 600,000 subscribers. I put a World of Warships video up, it'll get maybe 100,000 views. Because not everybody watches everything that I do, and also a fair number of those 600,000 subscribers are certainly not coming back every day to check what I'm uploading. Uh, they've subscribed and they come back every couple of weeks, every couple of months, maybe, just to see what's new. And that's absolutely fine. Uh, but the best I can do with 600,000 subscribers is probably 100,000 views. Maybe more, maybe less, depends on the content of the video. I've just checked. This guy has 3.3 million subscribers on YouTube. If he starts to do a regular World of Warships bullshittery video, one, it'll be hilarious, I guarantee, because I've watched his other bullshittery videos, and they are all side-splittingly funny. But whereas I can usually guarantee 100,000 views on a World of Warships video, I'm known for World of Warships. He definitely isn't. This, this game is definitely outside of his wheelhouse, so this is a new game for him, which means it's probably a new game for the majority of his 3,314,000 subscribers on YouTube. Now that's a lot of exposure for a game that is basically a niche title. So the fact that somebody as big as Soviet Womble is both playing and certainly seem to be enjoying World of Warships can only be a good thing for the game. And hopefully he will continue playing it and will continue enjoying it. Although the thing about Soviet Womble's videos and the games that he plays, I mean obviously he has to like the game in order to actually play the thing in the first place. But it's not really so much about the game that he's playing as the bullshit he can get up to with the people he's playing the game with. Um, and he certainly seemed to be accompanied by plenty of people who do play World of Warships and who do enjoy playing it and actually know what they're doing. <laughs> Unlike him. So I certainly hope he does continue playing and continue enjoying it and also getting better at it because not only will he then understand why the rest of his division or pissing themselves laughing at him. <laughs> um, but he'll be able to troll him back just as hard in the future. You never know your luck. I certainly hope so. Anyway, I'll put a link down below in the video description to his uh, YouTube channel, and I do recommend you check out his bullshittery videos in particular, because like I said, they are comedy gold. Anyway, that's about it for this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. I told you it was going to be a bit more upbeat than last week's episode. Although right now Will would have been more upbeat than last week's episode. But I, I really do need to go and get something to eat and make sure that I've crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's on that visa application because I wouldn't want to screw it up again. It's a long way to go to find out you haven't filled out the paperwork correctly. So I think at this point I'm going to start processing the video, get something to eat and then curl up on the beanbag in front of the big screen TV and amuse myself by watching Rita streaming Metro Exodus. I mean, I can kind of hear what's going on in the other room as she's streaming it right now, judging by all the shouting, screaming, crying, and swearing. <laughs> um, and trust me, it's been fun to watch. Anyway, 
that is it for today. Well, it's almost it for today. There's going to be a little bit running at the end of the video. Sammy Hallam, the very talented Sammy, who does all of the artwork for my channel, and also runs the Mighty Jingles storefront, where you can see a lot more of his art on things like t-shirts, hoodies, and mugs, has uh, introduced a couple of new products into the storefront lineup. And he's also put together an animated commercial for them, which I will be running if I ever shut my mouth and put this video to bed. So on that bombshell, that's it for this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found something to talk about in the comments. And as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.